The Musfarn Pottery Assemblage is a nationally significant group of Late Bronze Age ceramics and forms one of the most important assemblages of later prehistoric pottery ever recovered from Eastern England. So we're, we're really lucky at Must Farm to have really favourable preservation conditions for a lot of different artefacts, but especially for the pottery. So not only did the fire and the waterlogging help to preserve the contents of a lot of the pots, but the actual circumstances of how those pots came to be deposited in the river channel also helped um, keep them fairly intact and in a really good condition. The excavations of a series of stilted dwellings that burnt down in a devastating fire have yielded a combined total of 2,416 shirts of late Bronze Age pottery weighing nearly 80 kilograms. By weight, this is the largest assemblage of post Deverell Rimbury plainware pottery recovered from the Flagfen Basin and surrounding region, but more significantly, it is by far the best preserved of this period in Britain. In terms of pottery, the Must Farm assemblage is amazing. It locks in a moment in time in the late Bronze Age, a collection of domestic pots in a homestead. And it's really nationally, if not internationally, important. It tells us lots about the way people were using the pots, the way they were making the pots, and the way they were disposing of those pots. Um, but it also raises loads and loads of questions, which is sort of where I come in and where I'm, what I'm trying to find out about these pots. Um, but for me, being able to get a better understanding of a single group of pots from a single site at a single moment in time is just absolute gold dust. Prehistoric assemblages from the late Bronze Age often only contain one or two pieces of intact pottery, known by archaeologists as sherds. These sherds can provide an outline of a vessel, and occasionally a whole pot is discovered. In comparison, the Must Farm assemblage is largely made up of complete and semi-complete vessels. The vessels in the assemblage range in size, with rim diameters from 3 to 37 centimetres. So as the fire broke out, burnt and destroyed the buildings, as the material began to fall into the river channel below, items like the pots, so bowls, cups and storage jars, would have fallen onto a river that was quite shallow. And we know from environmental evidence that it was also full of vegetation. So as the pots hit this material, like reeds, they were kind of slowed down. And as they entered the water and fell into the, the soft muds and the sediments, they were cushioned and came to rest um, and were then buried and preserved for us to find 3,000 years later. Obviously, pottery is made from clay, but the type of clay that we use has a massive impact on the final pottery that you get. And, of course, over millennia, people have sought out sources of clay that would give them really strong, really functional pots. The pots at Must Farm um, are made from clays which they would have been finding locally. These are not necessarily made on within the structure themselves, we don't know that yet, but they are made from clays which would be found locally. And we know that from the fact that there are fossils within the clay, and that makes life really interesting. We, the, the, this clay that's being sourced is absolutely full of fossils. Now, whether or not they're using the clay in its raw state, straight dug from the ground, or whether they're using a secondary deposit that's being washed downstream, we don't know yet. But this clay is very fine, very hard, fires beautifully hard, and works really, really well. But to it, they are adding grits that will help to form the pot. Things like quartz, flint, grog, which is just crushed down old pots. All of these things are being added into the clay to make it more functional. And that is really important from the point of view of how these pots will fire, how they will function in the end. What we do see is a range of different mixtures of clay being used. So some of the pots have a lot of flint in them, some of them have a lot of grog, which is, as I say, crushed down old pots. Some of the pots have quartz within them. So somebody is selecting materials and adding them into the clay. And, and when you mix this particular clay, the, the, the 
clay that's coming from below the site, the Oxfordshire clay, it's very sticky, it's very wet. And I suspect that they're sometimes adding grog in to make the clay actually more workable while, while they're building the pot. But things like flint and quartz also make the plots more resilient as cooking pots, um, more resistant to thermal shock, to changes in temperature. So there are decisions being made. These potters are selecting materials to go into the clay that will enhance the pot in the end. And the fact that there are a whole variety of different mixes of clay going on suggests there are possibly a whole variety of potters involved here and that they are each selecting their own preferred mixes and possibly preferred mixes for particular uses for the pots. The majority of shares were recovered from the interior footprint of the structures, some of which would have made up the living assemblage at Must Farm. Uh, another preservation element from Must Farm that's, that's really beneficial to us as archaeologists is that a lot of the pots and the contents themselves display evidence of the, the fire. And we can look at those and actually start to reconstruct where those vessels were in the structures at the time of the fire. So when that blaze happened, the intense heat and the flames created unburnt and burnt areas on the outside of the pots that are often visible as really prominent lines around the surface. But what's even more exciting is the contents of those vessels, the foodstuffs that were inside them at the time of the fire, they're also similarly present in these really charred lines that are on the inside of the vessels as well as the outside. The most striking characteristic of the living assemblage, however, is the very high frequency of bowls relative to jars. So we encountered two different types of vessel fabric at Must Farm, and these can broadly be categorised as coarse wares and fine wares, which is something that's quite common for a lot of prehistoric pottery. Coarse wares, um, they're really defined by the amount of material that's included within the clay. So this is often elements that the potter has added deliberately, which we call a temper, and the larger that those inclusions and those tempers are, tend to be um, the results of, of coarser wear vessels. So these can be things like storage jars. And fine wares, these tend to be bowls or cups. They're made of a much finer material, hence the name. And these are often much, much smoother, um, and they're used to produce um, higher quality vessels, which are usually very heavily burnished. And that differentiation between burnished or polished vessels and unburnished ones is often a, a characteristic that we can use to define coarse wares and fine wares in post deverell Rimbri pottery, which is what we find at Must Farm. The coarse ware bowls, um, quite a few of them are more or less the same form as the fine ware bowls, and a, a lot of the definition, I think, comes down to uh, the intention of the potter in whether how far they're going to push the finishing uh, uh, of the pot. Um, but also, I think a fair few of the smaller courseware bowls are completely hand-formed rather than being rather than making use of maybe uh, uh, an old pot as a uh, as a former as a shape for it what they're doing is they're hand forming the pot and of course with with the smaller pots that doesn't need to be a coil pot it just needs to be a effectively a pinch pot and a pinch pot can be quite large it depends on the size of your hands my my hands can con accommodate a reasonably large lump of clay, which means I can make a reasonably large pot in my, ha in my hand. And to form a handmade courseware bowl literally takes a few minutes, really. And working it upwards, pinching it out, shaping it with your hand, and using your hand very much as a, as a former for the shape that you're wanting. Still working fairly thin, an economy of material, but also that benefit of easier firing it if you're making a nice thin walled pot. And using my thumb and fingers to thin out that clay and work it upwards, shape it as we go. And quite a few of these pots are, of course, flat bottomed, so you can work that down. Nice flat bottomed little pot. And just 
really quite quick forming up of the shape. This will be put aside and like many of the other pots, finished and refined once it's dried out a little bit. It's just it's just easier to to finish them off once they're uh, once they're reasonably dried out. So but the basic forming of the pot literally takes minutes. And it's sort of a, a squeeze and pinch, a little chuck it in the air. There we go. Round and round. I've said that we don't know whether these pots were being made at Moss Farm. Well, we don't, but there are a couple of clues that, for a start, there's a lot of pots. This really intrigues me, the number of pots, the stacked pots, pots stacked inside one another. But there are also retained what we call dead pots, um, pots which have been broken in use um, and either part of them has been disposed of or at least disappeared. It appears that they are retaining unburnished pots. They're, as far as I'm aware, there was no evidence of burnished pots within the grog used within the pots. That's rather amazing to be able to look at the contents of a pot and, uh, or the makeup of a pot and see whether some of it is burnished or not, but we can. And what they're using is they're using unburnished pots, which, make, which makes perfect sense. The, the unburnished pots will bind to the clay much better. So we have them retaining stuff which is almost certainly potter's materials and is highly suggested that they were making pots possibly on the platform or in the locality of the platform. The one puzzle, I suppose, is we don't know where they were firing them, and it's highly unlikely that they would have been firing them in the half on the platform. Although very small pots can be fired in a normal domestic fire, most of the pots at Must Farm are considerably larger. <laughs>